All right, so dear guests, uh, we are continuing our uh, talks with our third speaker, Professor Efrat Lifshitz. Uh, Professor Lifshitz graduated from Chemistry Department of Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and she earned her PhD in Physical Chemistry from University of Michigan Ann Arbor in 1979. She did a postdoc from 1984 to 85 in Wiseman Institute of Science. Afterwards, she worked as a research associate in chemistry department of University of Michigan. In 1991, she became an assistant professor in Technion Israel Institute of Technology, chemistry department, and she was promoted to full professorship in 2005. She won a number of awards, including Family Prize in Memory of Lee Tane for Nanoscale Sciences, awarded by the Israel Chemical Society, Fellow of the Freiburg Institute of Advanced Studies, University of Freiburg, Matthew Gansburg, Academic Chair at the Technion, and she has contributed to the field of nanotechnology by developing novel nanostructures and by enhancing understanding of their most fundamental physical properties using magneto-optical characterization tools, including optically detected magnetic resonance and microwave modulated photoluminescence. And please welcome Professor Lifshitz. So thank you very much for the kind introduction. So before I start my talk, first of all, I want to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me, for giving me the honor to come here. I'm absolutely impressed from the concept of university, from the foundation, in particular for this institute to giving the young generation that this is our obligation as academic people, giving them really the most uh, fundamental opportunities to, do, to learn the topic of nanotechnology with a very, very <coughs> wide perspective. So this is really highly appreciated. I'm very impressed with everything that is being done in this university. So I'll go to the a topic of my talk um, and is very specific but I will start with very general things. Uh, I like to talk about spins in nanomaterials. Uh, this is a topic that for some reason is left aside but we have to remember that this becomes an extremely integral topic because of the, the, the interest in quantum information. And many of the materials that we are discussing our potential materials for these uh, properties. Uh, so before I get into very specific materials that I'm talking, I want to just to go over a collage of projects that I've been doing and still doing some of them. So I started my career at the University of Michigan oh. as a PhD student working on layered semiconductors 
that we heard earlier in the morning, a fascinating topic, when nobody at that time discussed the word nano. But they are nano by nature, you know, they are grown as nano, nano thickness, okay, a, or sub nano thickness of each layer. And the materials that I worked on are very similar to molybdenum disalanide, but every third, every third metal position is replaced by phosphor, phosphor per. So this is another alternative for some of these materials. An intercalation compound was one of the topics that I worked over a decade until 1995, uh, 1995, 96, 97, and then I went to a sabbatical in Berkeley and I learned the topic of colloidal nanoparticles, not necessarily of layered materials, but of other materials like 2,6, 4,6, refix uh, compound. And in the last uh, 20 years, I've been doing a lot, a lot of, wor of work on colloidal nanoparticles. Most of the lecture will be on these colloidal nanoparticles. But using colloidal, the expertise of colloidal nanoparticles, I go back to some materials that are historically, you know, had been studied so far a lot, including perovskite materials, these layered materials. So we prepare them today, both in a classical way, but also as colloidal materials as well. So I won't be able to discuss everything today. I will give you some examples of these uh, perovskite materials. To my point of view, my perspective, they are derivatives of these two-dimensional materials because we have the layers of the metal in octahedral sides, but the only octa octahedrals are sharing edges, and they have cages, and the cages are uh, uh, amenable for some intercalation of foreign species, organic or inorganic. So that's very, very similar to intercalation compounds. So the, the talk will be focused on this perovskite and the classical semiconductors 2,6 and 4,6 4, 6 materials, which we grow as spherical particles, wires, uh, stars, cubes, and so on. And there is one thing that interests us for, for many, many years is the electronic properties, uh, magnetic properties, relation between them, and there is one thing that is always the spectator of all properties is the spin properties. So that's why I gave the title of spin properties in colloidal nanoparticles. So let's say something about the colloidal nanoparticles or colloidal or semiconductor nanomaterials in general. Uh, maybe people are know this, but you know, just for the, as a reminder, uh, the miracle that happens in these nanomaterials is that we have below a certain size, uh, we have a drastic changes in the electronic properties, which is pronounced as a change of the valence and conduction band that are continuous to be district states, and also the valence uh, conduction band edges, what we call the the band gap energy opens up as the nanoparticles become smaller and smaller. So we call this a quantum size effect. And all the special properties of semiconducting nanomaterials actually are a result of this re a change that, that took place. So these materials, for example, will absorb selective color of lights. Uh, therefore, we call them monochromatic lights. And also, if I take an electron from the edge of the valence band to the conduction band, it can stay there for a length of time with a selective spin orientation. I am really trying to use the spin language. So they don't deface for such a long time. And also, they can actually do decoherence because all the states are way far, far apart. And also, all the intensity of this absorption stay in one state. So they are very, very good materials as absorbers and also as emitters, and for that reason people have opportunity to do for them uh, lasers, light emitting diodes, biological labels, and so on. And sometimes they can absorb even more than one photon at the gap energy, but also in other energies. So uh, absorption and emission of photons is the main issue of their technology. And I would like to speak a lot about the properties of this absorption and emission and also another very basic things to say. When we absorb in a photon, we are creating a pair. Electron goes to the conduction band, but we leave a vacancy that we call it a hole. So we are preparing this electron and holes. 
Uh, horse is a positive charge for us and we call it an exciton. So if I use the word exciton everywhere, so you know what it is, okay? So I will talk about excitons and multiple excitons, more than one, and we'll see if they also have some spin properties, okay? And this will be the issue. So before I go into the physics, uh, let me just say a few things how we prepare it. One of the benefit of colloidal nanoparticle, nanoparticles uh, contrary to maybe other physical methods that we do by deposition, is that we can do everything in a very simple chemistry in solution, where we inject precursors into a smart solution, of course under inert condition and control of temperature, and eventually we are ending up with particles, okay, with particles that will have some uh, solvotation molecules absorbed onto the surface, and if you see a nuclei of this kind that have faceting, so you see that the sol solvent needs to have some leg molecules that have some functional group that can be deposited on the surface. So eventually I'm receiving nanoparticles with perfect crystallinity, but they're decorated by these, uh, I call it ligand molecules. Uh, modern way to do it, I know that there is one or two persons here in the audience that have a, a interest in microfluidics, so we also do it now recently in some microfluidic systems or in a big reactors in order to do upscaling. So these ligands that we put on the surface has a main role. First, that they can absorb to one facet more than the other, so they can dictate also the shape of these nanoparticles to be from spherical ones to roads to wires to other shapes. Secondly, they give me opportunity to make a connection between these nanomaterials and the outside world. So if I want to bound it to a biology meiety, so I'm putting some functional groups on these ligands here. And if I want to dissolve them in a polymer to do some composites and so on, so they are dissolvable, okay, in solvent. Or I want to print them, you know, for solar energy, for example, on on flexible substrate and so on. So the ligands are the, the, the mediator between the nanoparticles and the outside world. So indeed people really already did, and the same as in our group, we did already some biology application when we took these nanoparticles and we tied to them some medicine or some recognition, the recognition group to solar, to cancer cells, for example, as biological tags or we blend them into a polymer between two uh, uh, Fabry-Perot uh, uh, films to be a Q-switches in, in, uh, in lasers, or as a solar energy application between two oil electrodes or between two Bragg refractors for lasers. And here comes the spin-based devices <coughs> that is not yet applied. But analogy materials like MBE prepared materials are already very common in some quantum information devices. And that answer is why it is so delayed, so I will give you the answer and also give you maybe some solution. But we definitely can look on spins. Uh, so my spectator, as I said, will be the spins for the talk and we learn about exciton, the size effect, multiple exciton, surface effect, and so on. But I will always look where do I have spin and the spin will tell me who you are and who are your neighbors. So what kind of interaction you are doing inside the crystal. So this is really like a spectator, a spy, you know, that is che checking, you know, the properties of the materials. So what I don't want to do now, let me just make a, a, a quotation by, given by Einstein that said that any fool can know, but the point is to understand. So let me, if, if I take the right, to rephrase it, I don't like the word fool, so because we don't have fool people, in the, in the, you know, in, definitely not in this audience, but I think in general, in human, every, every, every person has some wisdom. So, but, but knowledge is, is very respectful, it's not, you know, it doesn't continue, well, but we really want more depth of understanding, particularly when we are sitting in academic world, and we have to educate our young generation that I'm very happy to see here for depth of understanding. So this is, to my point of view, a base for success. So for learning spin and excitons in, in some of these materials, we need to go to use a special tools 
already in the introduction you will say that I'm doing some photoluminescence in the presence of external magnetic field and a special method that we call optically detected magnetic resonance, a combination of magnetic resonance. Obviously you can guess if I'm doing spin properties <coughs> I need some magnetic, okay, magnetic methods, okay? So this will be the tools, okay. So let's start with the first group that I will discuss is two six materials. Where do we have spins? What I, you know, I'm talking about spin. Which sp spins I'm referring to? Okay, so let's say that this is the picture of the conduction band. This is the picture of the electronic states in the valence band. And I'm taking a photon and I'm exciting electron to go to the excited state. So this is my electron and hole pairs. This one has spin on its own. And this one has a spin on its own. So I already have two individual spins. Now they are not connected together. So at the excited state, okay, when each one of the carriers is separate in a different state, I have already two unpaired spins, so I can follow them. And sometimes I create two of them. And uh, more than two I can't. Uh, Pauli selection rules tells us that in any, L in any orbital I can put only two electrons, one with a spin up, one with a spin down. But if I make these uh, two of them, sometimes one of them can go to another state. Uh, electron can be trapped in a defect, so now this is individual state. If I have two, care, two electron hole pairs, one of them sometimes runs away, so I'm left with three body, so this will have a state, a, spe a, a plate. So anywhere I look, I have, if I, if I know how to look, okay, and, and, and use my wisdom, I can see that indeed I have spins to follow. Okay, uh, so, so as so far I told you many things good about the colloidal nanoparticles. They are flexible in all compositions, uh, I can do them at any size I want, any shape I want. I have ligands to tie them to the outside world. They're excellent absorbers, excellent emissions. It's, it's look as if I, I see everything in, you know, uh, as a perfect, but they're not. And we have problems. So now I have to introduce the problems. So I say that most of the application really wants excitons for absorption and emission. For example, for lasers, I must have at least two, two excitons because I need inversion of population. Uh, for solar energy, I like to have as many carriers as possible. You know, if I can make multi-carriers, this is perfect. So let's see what happens when we have two electron hole pairs. So these two electron hole pairs need personal space. And if I use only very simple everyday life words, I would say one electron hole pair tells the other, I'm sorry, there is no room for you. I'm, I'm sitting in a three nanometer or four nanometer box and there is no room. What do I mean room? Electron hole pair acts like an hydrogen atom, a electron in a, a one SL orbital and the nuclei and they have a distance that we, you know, in, the, in general chemistry or physics, we called it bore radius of this exciton or bore radius of this atom. Okay, so there is no room. They are about the size of this nanoparticle. So what is happening? One electron hole will do a recombination. It will give this energy non-radiatively to a third one. It will be converted into a kinetic energy and it will be exhaled out. At the very same moment, if I look on the emission of only one nanoparticle, uh, I lost the recombination of this because it was reabsorbed immediately and this one is now outside so it can't recombine with the whole. So I have silent. Nobody emits at this stage. So if I really measure it, I had intensity, it went to zero, intensity, it went to zero, intensity, it went to zero. It's like a lamp that, a light, you know, light bulb that's about to die, you know, it blinks. So we call it indeed blinking. And can you imagine that you want to do a laser from these nanoparticles and they have a tendency to blink? Or, you know, that you want it as a quantum information device and it blinks, so definitely this is deleterious, this is impossible. So of course we need, chemists need to give the answers because in the physics, in the, in the, coming from the physics side, this is so inherent that you can't overcome it in other way. Uh, only to make a comment, 
Uh, I told you about this ligand, so <coughs> in the past, including myself, but definitely most of the theoreticians would have told us the, the ligands on the surface has nothing to do with, with the fundamental physics of these nanomaterials. Uh, it's a soft material, it's a soft materials, it's only 40% coverage on the surface, and not all, you know, not every site in the surface is covered. Uh, but we discovered in recent years that it, this is not true at all. And maybe this extra carrier even can go to one of these ligands. Uh, and also, also the ligands play a major role in some of the uh, electronic properties of the materials. Okay, so what could we do? Uh, so here we come, uh, particularly uh, with a chemistry ba background, and we say maybe we can do a smart engineering uh, so we will suppress the blinking effect. Uh, so there are, there are so few solutions. We want to, us to be in a situation that we don't have this intermission and we have continuous uh, output of uh, emission and absorption. So the three alternatives that people are, pe people are giving in the recent years is, either, is to do actually more complex, com complex structures, what we call core and shell. It's like an onion. Uh, so we either do a core and a shell of another semiconductor or that we do uh, a core and additional layers in between uh, or also giant uh, core and, and a shell. One, one of them should be a little bit larger. So what is the idea? The idea that we will create a situation that we give a little bit more personal space at least to one of the carriers. And once you give, you have two pairs of electron and hole, this one recombined, the other one has a little bit more space. It can uh, also penetrate into the shell. At that moment, when we do that, we are reducing the, the extreme column interaction between two two pair of electron and two pair of hole because some of them can distribute to the shell. So we are reducing these strong column interactions and immediately we are reducing some of these blinking effects. By the way, I forgot to say that if one, a one carrier is actually ejected outside completely to infinite, we call this Auger process, and some of you may know this process. So I'm, I need to do something to suppress Auger. So Auger is the main reason for this blinking. So indeed this works, but it even works even better that this is the invention of our laboratory from 2004, I think was the, the, the first paper, that we do core and we do shell, but in between we put alloying composition between the core and the shell, so instead of having one step over here of a barrier, I have few steps of a barrier, and this makes the delocalization of one carrier a little bit better, but it has additional benefit because if I do core and shell, sometimes <coughs> I have hard uh, time to find the appropriate pair of semiconductors that will give me satisfaction in terms of the offsets electronically, but their chemical matching is not very good. So if we do alloying, we are also compensating for some crystallographic defects that may, to con uh, may take, na take place. So this is a big benefit, but we have, maybe I skip this, but maybe we, and, but we have additional very, very, very important uh, benefit, and this is the following. Let's, let's go on the very basic things. I apologize, I'm, I'm very fundamental in this talk but I don't want to lose the audience. So, you know, I'm going sometime into fundamentals, as some of you may know, but... Okay, a Auger process takes place when you take a carrier from a core level into an infinite. And then this, uh, a, from a core level into an infinite. So, but you have, and this uh, happens because of very, very elementary issue that we call Frank Holder effect. Okay, so to remind you from general chemistry. Uh, so we have to kill this, we have to kill it. So how do we kill it? If we take a, a, a this will happen when the barriers over here are extremely sharp. 
But if now I'm making core shell, 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 shell with a graded composition, I'm making a soft band boundary. So I'm breaking actually selection rules. So indeed you see here, over here, I plot it very sharp and start to make it smooth and smooth and smooth and more smooth. And this is calculation of rate of OJ, how it is really reducing by orders of magnitude. So I can really, uh, I have an answer now. I managed to prepare materials that we call them <coughs> blinking free. Okay, so we can make a lasers out of them, but we can also dream now about selective spins that because I suppress completely the blinking effect, will stay also coherent for a long time in order to do some quantum information application. So let's see if I'm right. So I have to prove to you, so one of the proofs is of course to study uh, absorption emission, but we will do it on one single nanoparticles because otherwise, you know, we are losing a lot of information for averaging and we do everything in cryogenic system, I'm sorry, uh, and with a big magnets because I want to do some influence of a magnet. So this is the magnet, this is uh, a confocal microscope, I won't go into the details, and here I have my nanoparticles, I'm coming with an objective and I'm looking on a mission of one nanoparticle, and sometimes I can manipulate this nanoparticle with an AFM tip for some electrostatic or magnetic fields, but I also put it in a microwave cavity in order to do my, uh, a magnetic resonance experiment. Okay, so this is a unique system, doesn't exist in other laboratories because this is a homemade. Okay, so indeed we have a proof for these uh, non-blinking materials. This is a core shell nanoparticles uh, and we see a spectrum that uh, 209 was one of the first to show explicitly that I have single exciton and, I, and two exciton, three exciton, four exciton didn't die because I suppressed Auger. Okay, I suppress this blinking effect. Uh, so here I have excitons that uh, becomes more and more intense with the laser intensity, but then they fade away, and I have then a growth of a bi-exciton, three exciton, four excitons, and so on, and they s sustain for a length of time, and they don't die. Okay. Uh, and then I do the same on other alternatives that are giant, either giant core or giant shell. You can even see here a picture of a microscope that you see the inner part and the shell. Okay, and sometimes I have more than one shell. I have, on, I have a couple of pictures of these. Okay, so then we said, okay, now I want to see if I have exciton, bi-exciton, three exciton, where, how do I measure what is the criteria to measure their spins? Okay, where do I measure their spin? So I have to be a little bit more specific and tell you the following. So this, this is a, a, my exciton. This exciton, a, before I plotted to you one line of the valence band, one line of the conduction band. This is naive. It's not true. These nanoparticles and electron and all are actually like particles in a hydrogen atom. But hydrogen atom, I'm looking only on the, you know, on one electron, but here now I have two carriers, electron and a hole. So they have a lot of type of interaction. So one of the type of interaction they call a exchange, and the other one it has to do with distortion and crystal field. So actually it's not only one line, but they will split into many different lines, not going into depths of it. The only important thing that I eventually I have only one layer that can meet by selection rules and this level also can split in the presence of external magnetic field into the sub-levels that each one of them is one specific spin orientation. And it will have, when it goes to the ground state, it will have either circular <laughs> polarization or in one direction or the other. So that's how I'm measuring the orientation of the spin, okay? Specific orientation of the spin will give me either circular polarization emission to one direction or to the other. In terms of spin electronics or quantum information, in quantum information we are searching always 
for two opposing conditions. <coughs> zero, one, zero, one, okay? So for me, a, a spin in one direction and spin in the other direction can be mimic of zero and one, or linear combination of the two spin orientation and, an, and another, okay? So I can either see linear polarization, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I keep on, uh, okay, either I can see linear polarization when they are mixed or circular polarization, both are okay, this is two opposing direction, this is two opposing direction, okay, and I want them to be open up as much as possible, so my quantum information signal will be as clean as possible, okay, what will bring me a large energy difference between, between two opposing information. Uh, I need it to be as open as possible. Okay, so we have uh, a, a new method to make this energy difference between two opposing uh, conditions uh, in artificial way. It is still all right, all right and all good, very good, in the colloidal nanoparticles, which are non-blinking, the way I told you so far. But this wasn't too satisfactory. So recently we started to do some project. One project is in collaboration with Professor uh, Volkan Demir, but also uh, some independent work that we're doing in our work. And we are putting some impurities inside our nanoparticles, which are magnetic impurities. Now what happens when you are created your exciton, electron and hole, and you have next to it an impurity that has spins. I told you this exciton has individual spin, electron and hole both have a spin. So it turns out that once you turn one exciton on, okay, by a laser, a spin, this is a spin, individual spin, or many spins, whatever we select, this exciton, plus and minus, now introduce directions, selective directions, so all the spin in a surrounding are immediately orienting themselves to be parallel or anti-parallel, or parallel or fer ferroelectric or anti-ferroelectric, <coughs> uh, magnetic, I'm sorry. So this one now created a big spin inside my, my lattice, okay? It's like a giant magnetization. And this giant magnetization works as a feedback on the exciton to keep his uh, two spin directions opposing, as if I put an external magnetic field. Five, five, five minutes? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Okay, I have a little bit more. Okay, so, so, I'm, oh, so I'm, oh, uh, I have to keep myself. Uh, so I'm really creating internal giant magnetization. Giant magnetization means also that I'm changing a G factor. I don't know if everybody knows what is a G factor. G factor is a monological factor. Uh, this is, uh, for those of you that have done NMR, ESR, this is like a, you know, chemi chem chemical -ish chemical shifts of, of this kind. This is a, a, a factor that actually check, you know, the influence uh, on the magnetization. So this, this we have to keep, to keep, you know, this is a factor that we'll follow. And also long coherence time, because if two spins energies, two spin states are far apart, there is no way they will mix. So each one of them will reserve selective direction for length of time. We call it coherence time, okay, coherence time of this. So this will be, this means memory for a length of time, okay, clearance and no mixing in information and, and this is very, very important. Okay, so uh, one, or, uh, one more that is in, in, in how this happens, actually we have a complete interaction of the spin either with the spin of the electron or the, of the hole or with the spin of the electron because my electron was in orb orbital of the type S, the hole was on an electron of the type P, so we call it SPD, 
and the manganese has, uh, or manganese or any another man magnetic uh, impurities have d orbitals. So we call it just for the professional terminology in the literature, SPD interaction, okay? So for those of you that follows the literature. So indeed we did these core shell materials because we want non-blinking, zero dimension, two dimension, one dimension. We can put the manganese impurities selectively here or selectively here. <laughs> And, and that means that if I'm delocalizing one carrier, that means that I can learn selectively the interaction between the electron spin and the guest or the whole spin and the guest. And most people don't do it in this way around the world, but this is what we did. So uh, most of the data I will show you on the 2D, but we have uh, complete sets of, any, um, of many things. Okay, so you can even see that we did uh, a scan -tem of some of the materials that we did and I don't know if you see because of the light but we can really monitor the, you know, the, the very, very low level of impurities and where they are located in the core or in the shell. So we have a very good uh, control of it. Okay. So how do I learn about this interaction to prove to you? I told you the story, I gave you the answers, but how can I follow a giant magnetization, G factor, the specific interaction, electron and a, a, a guest, hole and guest. How can I do it? Magneto-optics. Okay, so what do I do? Uh, first, I, I can do photoluminescence uh, only as a function of temperature. Why it is important? This is the undop, this is the dop materials. You see the where the, this is the emission, this is the absorption. There is a big stock shift. Where the stock shift comes from? because I'm wasting energy to take electron, the, my exciton, and coupling to it a gas spins costs energy. So everything is shifted, okay, in energy. So that's why I have this larger shift. So I'm plotting this stock shift energy as a function of temperature. And what happened in the lower temperature, they're all aligned, but in a higher temperature, I have to work against this giant magnetic region, have to work against uh, thermal fluctuations, okay? So I'm pl plotting it over here and I'm using an equation, theoretical equation, uh, people that are more non-professional uh, in the audience, it's called a brilliant function. Uh, so we, I'm, doing, I'm using this uh, uh, equation to do the simulation and I'm coming up with the fact that I have effective spins of 14 and up to 26, it depends on the size of the nanoparticle and so on. Tesla, when I did my experiment, I put three Tesla, five Tesla. It's even more than I can generate by in, you know, in my instrument in the, in the lab. It's a huge internal magnetization, huge. Okay, one, one guest atom can do it. Okay, and then I do circular polarization measurement, sigma plus and sigma minus, and I'm plotting the difference between them. This is what we call degree of circular polarization as a function of external magnetic field. And I'm receiving now a giant magnetization between six to eight, depends on the size of the nanoparticles, when without impurities, this is one, 1.5. So this is really giant. Okay, so I really gained what I need. Okay, but I want to know the source where it comes from, okay? So the source where it comes from, it really, uh, you know, I had to fit this uh, function to this uh, expression and this energy over here is given by the Zeeman interaction, sometimes diamagnetic shift, and this is the terms that tells me what is here. Alpha is the coupling between electron and a guest. Beta is the coupling between hole and a guest. In this expression, it's together in this experiment. And I want to know, know it separately, okay? So what would I do? I do a little bit more complicated experiment and we call it optically detected magnetic resonance. Somebody knows in the audience using optically detected? No, no knowledge. As you hear, it's a magnetic resonance. Uh, Magnetic resonance example is NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, ESR, electron spin resonance. And in a previous lecture of uh, uh, Professor Oranal, she, she mentioned the uh, MRI, magnetic res uh, resonance imaging, that maybe from practical life most of us know what it is. It's based on the fact that you follow spins, okay? 
and you do magnetic resonance, what is the magnetic resonance? That you do flip-flop. The spin was in, in, with a pole to the north and you convert it to, you know, to the south. That's what you're doing. And uh, this energy depends on the surrounding. You know, if it has many interactions with the surrounding, so that's how it is sensing the image and doing imaging of the surrounding also. So for me, the same. Who you are and who are your neighbor? Are you an electron? Are you in the neighbor of the manganese uh, doping? Are you in the core? Are you in the shell? And so on. Okay, so who you are, who are your neighbors? This is the, what I'm getting out of it. So you remember this diagram that I, I don't want you to go into it, I mean, even before. Uh, these are the two emitting states that will be polarized, plus and minus. And now each one of them is split by additional state that these are the spins of the guest. And if I used manganese, this is a typical sex state. It's like a fingerprint, always. Okay, so manganese has five halves, but it always will give six lines, 2s plus 1 to remind somebody if, if this is important. But manganese has a, another thing. Manganese also has nuclear spins. And we see what happened now. Okay, so let's put this as a question just to, to show you how I do this experiment. This is my cryostat, the magnets, and I also put a microwave resource into it, and all the rest is optics. So I'm measuring it not in the ground state, because in the ground state I don't have electron and holes. Okay, I measure, I'm doing it in an excited state. So I'm doing perturbation of magnetic resonant excited state, but I'm measuring how it is influenced the, the emission. That's why I call it optically detected, contrary to ground state NMR or ESR, okay? So that's what I'm receiving. This is for the undoped, this is for the doped, and if you see, one, two, three, four, five, six. I told you it will split into sextet, okay? Uh, so, the review from the very, very beginning said, oh, these shoulders, I don't know if I believe you. So, uh, look at this. I plotted this one after four months, this one, and after a few, few other months, is this one. Always come in the same place. And if I do different batches also, this is the project we are doing with Volkan, and Volkan and his students actually prepared these 2D materials, but we did all the optically detected measurements. But surprisingly, I thought that, it, oh, and I'm comparing it, by the way, with the ground state ESR. So I thought that this one, actually, this splitting over here, this will be exactly my alpha or beta. But if I, I alpha and beta, and this expression uh, that appears here also in the big spin Hamiltonian was supposed to be in a milli electron volt range. But we are receiving micro electron volt range. So I went to do the ESR, the ground state ESR. So also the ground state ESR is microelectron. It's even sub-micro. <laughs> okay. So that means that the splitting that we see here, it's not interaction between my electron and manganese electron, but manganese and nuclear spin electron. And this is said for the first time. People forget about the nuclear spin all the time. But nuclear spin can kill coherence, and this is very, very important. Okay, so let's progress because um, uh, I want to go to the other table. We also did, uh, I I'll only tell you, and I want to discuss so much the details on this, is we did even more complicated experiment that we call time-resolved ODMR, that I prepared this spin that locks gas and host spins, and how much they live this way and how much, whoops, they will lose face, okay? Uh, so I'm getting an answer that I expected a long, long, long coherence time because of this lock, and it turns out to be the reverse, but this is due to the fact that I probably prepared an excellent giant spin, but then I killed it because of the nuclear interactions. So if you ask me what shall I take for application, manganese is perfect in terms of giving giant magnetization, but if I can take something that have high spins, like manganese, but it doesn't have nuclear spin, 
for example, iron or some of the others. So we are on our way to exchange, you know, some of the dopants. So, but we have, that's why we need to learn everything to the very basic. If you don't learn it, you take it to practice and you don't know why you don't have good uh, coherence there. Okay, so, uh, okay. So now uh, I want, uh, how much time I have? 10 minutes maybe? 10 minutes? Okay, perfect. So let me leave two six compounds, uh, which by the way, we did a lot of similar work on four six materials, uh, which are very, very interesting because they have tunability not in the visible spectral regime, but the infrared spectral regime. And for that reason, they are very, very interesting for infrared technology. Uh, and this, in another opportunity, I will give you another big talk because I worked on it nearly 15 years. And we are doing a lot of new materials that are non-toxic. And in the infrared regime, this has a lot of interest. But what can I do that I can't tell you everything today? So I took selective two topics and I'm going into depth with, more, with each one of them, okay? This was my selection, so you will excuse me for it. Okay, perovskite materials, we also grow them by colloidal chemistry, so I won't repeat, you know, many things we said about colloidal chemistry. Uh, there are many families. Their general chemical formula is A, M and X, sometimes X3, sometimes X4, it depends on the structure. Uh, and M can be PB, but nowadays we try to, to convert them to tin and be smooth and a few others, again, for getting away from the non-toxic materials. But PB works the best, so let me discuss the PB. And they have these layered and layered, but they are sharing edges. They are layers that touch only on one point, you know, <laughs> each other. Uh, but they have this cage over here that can accommodate only small cations, uh, either organic like methyl ammonium, foramidium, and cesium plus one. And uh, when I pre uh, prepare them in different halides or oxide or calcogenides in general, but I will talk only the halides, particularly the bromine, they all can also change the color. Also a little bit with, with size effects, but not very large effect as much as the 2,6. Obviously, because the, rad the, core rad the radius of the exciton is extremely small. So, you know, you, you just don't see a difference between them. Okay. Uh, like the stories that Professor Reshef Tene told us uh, earlier in this fascinating talk, earlier in the morning, uh, some of these materials had been discovered decades ago, but they have a new renaissance. Uh, the perovskite also in this 60s, 70s, you know, people studied perovskite, but they didn't know what to do with it, so they put it in, you know, in, in the door for, for many, many years, until maybe a decade ago. There is, all of a sudden, there is a, re a renewed interest because people have tried them for solar energy to replace actually some organic, uh, organic solar, you know, organic uh, Gretzel type cells. Uh, obviously, it comes from laboratory, in similar laboratories. And they discovered fascinating uh, response in photovoltaic. And now when you start to look for, for the reasons for it, so we, we prepared a list of properties that already people discovered. Uh, they have uh, simple preparation, variable composition, morphology, self-healing. Uh, they have some ligand effects similar to what I said. Long carrier diffusion lengths, really hundreds of nanometer but on the same time, extremely good fluorescence. And in many semiconductors, this sometimes can become a conflict. You know, there are recombined very good, but they are not very good conductors and vice versa. Tolerance to defects. I personally don't believe that they don't have defects. Such heterogeneous materials without defects, this is probably impossible, but for some reason, the carrier that needs to travel in the valence band conduction band just doesn't feel it. And, and I, I may give you some of the answers for it. Electron phonoline coupling to make some polarons, small exciton binding region already, ferroelectricity in some of them, not in all of them, and more and more. So we have to understand where all this comes from, you know? Such a contradicting, so I, um, okay. 
Uh, so as I said, people for the first discovered photovoltaic, but now they are making some uh, light sources, by the way, X-ray, gamma ray detectors, people are making already from them uh, lasers. And I want to claim that I can use it off of spin devices, but you will see where, because the talk speak about spin, so I will show you that we have also spins here, okay? Uh, okay. Uh, so I said uh, Einstein again that uh, the most beautiful things we can experience uh, is, is come from mystery, you know, from mysterious things that we don't know how to explain and then we are coming up with, you know, very nice uh, in, uh, investigations. Okay, so uh, to go to spins of these nanomaterials and this will give some of the answers to the questions that are left as a, my as a mysterious. So, these materials are composed from heavy metals. Heavy metals will induce spin-orbit coupling. I don't know how many people are re remembering what is spin-orbit coupling. Uh, maybe a very fast, okay, as a reminder, our electron spin is all, you know, can spin around the axis of itself. But there is also motion of an orbit uh, that can couple to this spinning. Okay, so he, p he feels the spinning of himself, but also the spinning of this, because the spin of the orbit is generating effective spin, okay, and effective field. Okay, when you, you remember the right hand rule, right? So when you have an electron that is making a round motion, it creates 90 degrees to it a, spin, a, a field. So a spin will feel any field in the area. Okay, so they couple. This is the way they couple. And you see, this is the momentum of the spin and this is the effective spin. So this, lo look at this expression, okay, and remember this, okay? Okay, so how it helps us. Uh, the electronic band structure of these nanomaterials is composed from P orbitals of the, in the conduction band and S orbitals in the valence bands coming from, this come from the metal, this come from, from you know, mixture between the metal and halide. Uh, and P orbital has an angular momentum 1 and a S orbital has an angular momentum S. So this is quantum chemistry, basic quantum chemistry. All the orbit were supposed to be L plus L up to S, S minus L. So I was supposed to have here many orbitals that together will have angular momentum, three halves, halves and so on. But spin orbit coupling helps me throw all the big numbers out. <laughs> okay, and I'm left in the, in the valence band conduction band only with half plus and minus half. Okay, so that, that's perfect. It looks clean, but... Okay, uh, this is the structure that we have, this is the structure that we have, and remember that I say that we have octahedra, that this is the skeleton, and the band structure calculation mentioned nothing about what goes in, no electronic states of the, of the guest, okay, Met methyl ammonium or cesium, nothing, okay, but they play a major role really a major role, you will see in a minute, because this methyl ammonium or cesium don't stay still. Look at this, that's what they are doing. Bombardment of the main skeleton all the time. So they destroy the symmetry. So even if it's very symmetric, they destroy it. And when they destroy it, they break inversion of symmetry and breakage of inversion of symmetry combined with spin orbit coupling give us a new phenomenon. This new phenomena, uh, let me skip. I may get a chance to go back to it. <coughs> ah. I don't have it here. Sorry. I, uh, okay. It gives us a new phenomenon, okay, that we'll have to deal with this, and I don't call it his name. The name of the phenomenon is called Rajba effect, okay? And I will come to this Rajba effect. I, I apologize, I thought that I, I had in mind, I, I, I jumped in my mind already way too far. Okay, so um, we do photoluminescence and magnetic photoluminescence of these materials only to pay your attention to one very important thing. This is still not nano, but we compared it with bulk crystallographic uh, materials, 
And you see that I have the reflection and emission, and I have a small bump over here, and also over here, so when I blow up, uh, you see one here and the main one. And this is uh, an exciton of first order, one exciton, but also an ex exciton of a second order. You remember that I say that I can have exciton and bi-exciton and so on. So we see them. Okay, so first of all, we see them. Okay, it's very, very good. So the same thing I see also afterwards for if I take a nut. So this is the one that I showed you before. And now we go to single nanoparticles. So this would have been the emission of single nanoparticles, of, of a collection of nanoparticles. And this is a single nanoparticle. So you see why I want to learn single nanoparticles. Because this is thousand times narrower, okay? Non-blinking. So now let's go to the single nanoparticles and put it in an external magnetic field. And you see, this is the sharp one that I've seen. I saw some shoulders. These are the shoulders that I showed you. Let's ignore for our discussion all the shoulders. And I see that this one split. And I do it in different fields, uh, one up to a Tesla. And I plot it here, OK, the, the line here and the line here, the line here and line here, different fields. And if this was very simple semiconductor, I would expect the behavior to go like the dashed line. Only Zeeman interaction, okay, that split my lines. But you see that it's not. First of all, they don't coincide here in, in, zero, in zero. This is, by the way, the, the dots, collection of 1,500 different scans. So nobody convinced me that I don't have a split. But the speed is very small in a milli-electron volt, sometimes in a micro-electron volt, so, you know, sometimes you miss it. But if you do single particles, you can learn it. Uh, so, uh, so this is the split, okay? And if I take the energy, I split. So I see a split. This was supposed to be a regular Zeeman, and definitely it doesn't behave as a straight line, okay? So where is the physics that justify it? Okay, so the physics stands here. I'll skip this. Uh, the physics stands here. I have this cage, and I have a gas inside that bombards it and, and destroys the lattice all the time. <coughs> Destroying a lattice means that I'm inducing electric dipole in one direction. Inducing electric dipole by Lorentz force, okay, basic physics, means that I'm inducing also a magnetic field. 90 degrees to it. So in my in induction of magnetic field, okay, I won't go into all the own equation, but it looks nearly like spin orbit coupling. We'll do the following. Instead of having one minima in the conduction band, but also in the phalanx band, it will split into two. And this is called Rashba effect. Okay? And Rajba effect was developed, or used to be Dresselhaus effect, and then it was modified to a Rajba effect. And this was mainly for, for anisotropic materials, okay? That dielectric mediums are different, and they have inversion of symmetry breaking. If you have inversion of symmetry breaking, to my point of view, we can find them a lot in 2D materials, in which we are working on it. So right now, I have spins in Rajba effect dictate the fact that I can have in one minima spin in the one direction and in the other direction, in the other valley, I will have another direction. So here are my selective spins. If I fail into one valley, I have one spin direction. If I fall into another valley, I have another spin direction. Okay? So, this is the two valleys in the conduction band, and this is the two valleys in the valence band. Splitting is a little bit shorter, but the spin here only match this one. So I can have only this going back to the ground state to save spin selection rules, so that I don't flip the spin. But this one is sitting in another momentum, and this one is sitting in another momentum. So transition to what that looked direct completely for me at the very beginning, they look nearly indirect in character when they go back to the ground state. They still emit pretty well. But when they stay in one of these selective valleys, 
they have a long time because they are nearly indirect in character. And we know that any semiconductor that have indirect character is emission is milliseconds. So for that reason, they will reserve their spin because there is no way to flip them. And they are also, so therefore my claim is that they are good also for quantum information and quantum based or, or spin devices, other spin devices. But they also can have a long diffusion length because they stay there for a long time. And because of their spin selectivity, to my point of view, they are becoming a little bit more tolerant to defects. Okay? So uh, if we only look on the spin properties, we understand a little bit in a larger depth a lot of the physics. This is my claim, okay? Okay, I have a little bit more, um, but I, I exhaust my time, right? Yeah, yeah, I exhaust my time. Only to tell you one more thing, that if you think that I forgot nuclear spin, I didn't. <laughs> Okay, so when I plot this sigma plus minus sigma minus, like I said for two sigma here, instead of only seeing one plot of here, before this comes to here, it goes down, boom, and goes up. And this has to do with the fact that I have nuclear spin at a very small field that compensate the external of everything in a, rev in a reverse sign. So it goes negative first and then it goes positive. And this is, was, is not published yet, we are writing this, but this should go to a very prestigious paper because this is really a, a new a new word to say. Okay, so I, uh, I, I put here and there some equations. I didn't mean to go over them, but for those of you that really want to follow it, uh, more than welcome as, you know, to ask questions and definitely this presentation will be given to you so you know, if you want to, f to study it in a little bit larger depth. Okay, okay so as a summary, we wanted very much to have uh, make these colloidal materials accessible for all the technologies you know, that we discussed and maybe for a few more, that more to come in the future. Uh, we must use these protected nanoparticles, core shells, not only because of the chemical protection, but also because of the significance of suppressing OG. Okay? So we are really nearly suppressing OG. We can enhance uh, magneto-optical uh, properties by making dopants of these nanoparticles, which we proved it by optically detected magnetic resonance. And for the other materials, the perovskite, we have this special Rajba effect that uh, to our point of view can dictate many of the mysterious conflicts, okay, that we discussed in the nature of these materials, which makes them really, and more to come, and investigate, you know, investigation in this direction on, on spin interaction, electron interaction, and, and nuclear interaction in many of these materials. And, uh, some of these properties are already investigated also in the other families of materials. So I, I selected two families uh, in a more explicit way to bring to you. So I thank you very much for your attention. But before, of course, I have a list of many graduate students that contributed. And some of them are here on, in the picture, not all of them. And I have a few very good collaborators that we did a lot of the work together, Maxim Kovalenko with perovskite material, Daniel van Beckenberg for some of the 2.6 materials, Andrew Repo for the theoretical issues, but also Shasa Efforts for the theoretical, and uh, Volkan, as I uh, mentioned to you over here. So thank you very much for your attention. You promised to show the Baha'i Center. You promised to sit. Ah, the Baha'i, uh, yeah, well, this was a private discussion yesterday at dinner time. Uh, this is a picture of the slope of the mountain in Haifa. Haifa is a sister city to San Francisco, so we have a nice bay. And, and uh, all the city is actually on, on the slope of the mountain. Uh, so the Baha'i, um, tr uh, traditionally, the, the Baha'i 
religious was developed around Haifa surrounding in Akko in, in Haifa and their holy temple is in Haifa and they believe that the uh, beauty of nature uh, increase inspiration of a humankind to be more relaxed, related to, to, li to like, you know, women uh, we, we, uh, in, in, in nature and uh, personality in general. So this is a picture, part of the uh, Baha'i temples, which are extremely beautiful uh, gardens, really very nice. So you are all welcome to come to visit uh, in Haifa and in the Technion in the future and see these uh, Baha'i temples. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> Thank you, Efrat. Uh, we can accommodate maybe one or two questions. Uh, yes, please, from the back. Thank you for the nice presentation. I have two questions about your interior, how to the Okay, okay. First one, what's the electric structure of that material? What? The electric structure in terms of the pipe. Electronic structure? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I well, I you know, I, I, yes. Thank you for the question. So uh, you the second one is: Have you considered the single uh, extra regime lasing at these materials or not? I, I single uh, extra regime. Uh, single exiton yeah. regime. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, first question: a Extremely relevant question. When you take caution materials. Uh, you have uh, uh, two, two typical characteristics. One of them, that the homoluma of the internal one is actually wrapped. I'm sorry that I'm using my hands. Wrapped that of the external one, and that's what we call type 2. And in this case, all electron and hole will stay in the inner part. This is very good for lasers when you want very, very strong recombination. The other alternative that if you want to suppress Auger uh, is to take a different uh, situation that L a homoluma of the internal one is scattered, uh, is uh, scat uh, staggered like this way or this way. Then only one carrier will go to the other regime. So indeed I gave a, a, an example of type 2, uh, but even in type 1 you can uh, again nowadays a uh, blinking free when you take giant <laughs> shell so uh, it, the shell is so thick, so wave function don't spill to the surrounding anymore, and then you can't eject a carrier out anymore. Okay, so it's like a big barrier, okay, like infinite barrier. Okay, the other question, um, single exciton, we do this uh, G2 type of experiment, autocorrelation experiment when we do single dot. It was on the transparencies, but I skipped some details. Uh, you're, you're measuring if you are counting only one photon emission at a time. And then you know that you are in a single exciton regime. And if not, this is the indication for two or three. And we also did the uh, power dependence in, in, uh, compared with simulation, how it can change with the power of the laser. So that's how we made the assignment, what is one exciton, two, three, and four. Okay? But I couldn't tell you the entire story. Uh, many thanks for the presentation. Uh, I would like to ask a question about the revert metallic. Uh, could we also control the lifetime of the electron on the metal state state when we apply the main to uh, uh, In a 2 6 materials or perovskite? Oh, I mean, you can also control Yes. Um, okay. Can we also look the lifetime of the electrons? I, I do all the time. Also, you know, I have many data. I was in e everything we study, absorption, emission, all temperature, external magnetic field, lifetime, everything is studied. Um, yes, indeed. When you make design of core shell materials, you can control also the lifetime. Because if you are spreading one carrier into the shell, sometime in a situation that you shift it completely into the shell, then you're making an indirect semiconductor, definitely you extend the lifetime. If you want them to be very fast, you bury them all in one place, or either only in the core or only in the shell, then the overlap between the electron and hole is larger, and then the recombination is faster. 
So like type one, I will take if I want very fast lifetime. Type two, when I want to slow the, the, the process. Okay, is that answers your and question? Could you control the lifetime? I can control it by composition. By you know, composition. By, by composition by and also by thickness. Um, because also the shell is uh, experiencing <coughs> size confinement. So if the shell is very thin, the shell itself, homo lumo, is wide, means that he, he puts a high barrier on the core, so then the carriers won't climb up there. The shell is thick, you start to close the homo lumo of the shell, and then more likely, you know, it, carriers will be transferred into it. So either changing composition or changing the relative dimensions between the core and the shell. But when you try to manipulate the field, what could be a uh, if, if lifetime change the magnetic field, it can change it slightly. Uh, so we can regulate it as well. Okay? One final question. Um, so I'm a little bit confused about the Rushba effect. In Rushba, the yeah. Perovskite. Yeah. Uh, what breaks the inversion symmetry? I, I Break the inversion I symmetry? Uh, the lattice was uh, a either tetrahedral or thorombing. By the way, perovskites suffer from phase transition, but we worked only at low temperatures, so it was only one so phase. Those experiments were from the for low temperatures, low. but particularly this material, uh, they go to be the same phase until room temperature, and they send ev everything after. So we didn't suffer from it, but just as a comment, uh, so orthorhombic have inversion of symmetry. Uh, if, if you are distorting the, the skeleton, okay, now they have a unique cesic, so they are not, they are breaking inversion of symmetry, okay? When you break inversion of symmetry, so you're looking in one direction and the other, it's not symmetric anymore. Okay. So, so that's why... The results you showed <coughs> At low, at low temperatures. Okay. I, I, not, not because the inversion symmetry, it will break also at higher temperatures, the, the, the inversion of symmetry will be broken. But because I wanted to see the splitting, and in, in, in room temperature, some the lines are so wide that you don't see the splitting when it is in a milli electron volt okay. region. Okay. 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 Like yeah, okay. Uh, how about you have it during the coffee break? So I thought it's here. We can have it uh, in a coffee time. I'm, yes. I'm here for the entire, you know, I'm here until tomorrow, so I'm really happy to discuss. Right, so let's give her another round of applause. <laughs> and we'll be back at uh, 3.30, so in 15 minutes. <clears throat> Sure, sorry, no, no, 